It's September 21st, 1996, and Kelsey Grammer is on top of the world, or at least Hollywood. The Frasier star powers his shiny new Dodge Viper through the winding roads of Mulholland Drive, far above the shimmering lights of Los Angeles. The car is stuffed with horsepower, without a hint of traction control to be found. Grammer, perhaps inspired by the Viper, has supercharged himself also with a proprietary blend of drugs and alcohol that have given him enough BoJack horsepower to feel like the laws of physics don't even apply. This was the 90s, and supercars, as well as Dr. Fraser Crane, were having a major moment. For any car enthusiast, it'd be a dream to drive, but not for Dr. Fraser Crane, who had very publicly renounced his sobriety on a Thursday night at a James Taylor concert. He stood, swaying at the venue bar, where he pounded drink after drink in a room full of gawking celebrities, watching him fall right off the wagon and into his sports car. On the winding turns of Mulholland, Grammer ran through the Viper's gears, the motor roaring against the surrounding hills, the weary star relieved that home was just a few turns away. Unfortunately for Grammer, he made a common mistake, trusting the incredible but untamed performance of the 90s supercar. Viper flipped while rounding a corner. The car was totaled, but Grammer survived, managing to crawl out from underneath the twisted pile of Detroit steel and aluminum with only minor wounds. Today on Pass Gas, why the 90s were the best decade for supercars ever. Cars like the lightning fast McLaren F1, the objectively sexy Lamborghini Diablo, and the very weird and very amazing Vector W8. What made these supercars super special? How did muscle cars pave the path for modern exotics? And could we ever see another golden age of these high performance, high price autos? Dust off that Lamborghini poster you got at the school book fair and tack it back up in your bedroom wall. It's the 1990s and supercars are king. Best ass podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. COVID spring break is right around the corner and you know what that means, spring break in your pants. I did not write this copy. Manscaped is here to provide you with the best tools for your grooming experience. You already know this, guys. The Lawn Mower 3.0 trimmer is the best hygiene tool for the modern man. I love mine. Because of the ceramic blade and advanced skin safe technology, guys, your snags on your snowballs will be reduced. The trimmer is also waterproof, so you can trim in the shower or jacuzzi if that's your thing. Uh, don't do that. That's gross. Manscaped's performance package is the best buy of 2021. The performance package comes with new and improved Lawnmower 3.0, Weed Whacker, Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Performance Boxer Briefs, they are very comfy, and a travel bag called The Shed. I bring mine with me everywhere. Have you ever noticed how nasty nose and ear hair is? In fact, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff, but you can take care of it. And to do that, you gotta use the best tools for the job. This bundle also comes with Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner. That's right, the Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant that'll make your balls smell nice. The Crop Reviver, on the other hand, is a spray-on toner for your balls, okay? It's made with soothing aloe and witch hazel extracts that make your balls look up and say, thank you, sir. Manscaped is here to ensure that the party in your pants never stops. For everyone preparing for a pants party this spring break, I have an exclusive 20% off discount. Use code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code GAS20. Say aloha to your new beautiful balls with Manscaped. Now let's slow things down a bit and give a big shout out to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Did y'all know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? I knew because I know everything. <laughs> Not only were they the first patented motor oil, they've had a ton of firsts in the industry. The oil industry, that is. Well, let's go through some of those first. They developed the first high mileage motor oil, they developed the first synthetic blend oil, and the first racing oil. And for 150 plus years, they haven't stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road. In fact, every motor oil that Valvoline produces has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standard. Their oil fights the four main causes of engine wear, which are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. But there's another reason that we love Valvoline over here at Donut, and it's because their name is synonymous with some of the best race car drivers on this fat green earth. I'm talking Mark Martin, Kale Yarbrough, AJ Foyt, 
and the new NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott. So do yourself a favor and choose Valvoline. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find the best Valvoline oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Baby, I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. <laughs> that guy? That, that guy, guy was on drugs? That guy had a no. viper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, take your offer on uh, a show on NBC, but I get to do the theme song, all right? Uh, uh, oh, sure, sure. Let, let's hear it. Baby, I don't know what to do with the dog daddy. Ding, 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 ding. It's like a uh, Charles Manson song. It sounds like, have you have I ever showed you the the clips from like the Montreal Jazz Festival scat? Is it? It's all white people, right? Yeah, it's all French, yeah. French white people going like, beep it up, but do 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 boop, do do. And then, like they trade off and they're all equally bad. <laughs> Hey, man, you got to express yourself somehow, you know. It's true, doesn't yeah. doesn't matter how. Uh, anyway, welcome to Past Gas. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by James Pumphrey. Hello there, everyone. It is I, James, and not an imposter. <laughs> and Joe Weber. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? I'm here for you, and I am fired up. <laughs> And as as the boys have been uh, saying, we are talking about 90 supercars today on this episode. We were talking before we started recording. Um, I think like we're a little biased as far as the 90s being the greatest time for supercars. That's like us saying like the 90s is the best time for cartoons. Yeah. Um, because that's when Joe and I grew up, at least. When when did you grow up, Nolan? How old are you? You're, you're six. <laughs> you're six years old, huh? Yeah, I was, I mean, I was born in 93. So like my... okay. So yeah. yeah, you're the first time when you realized supercars were a thing was in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I heard Third Eye Blind on the radio, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. What about three eleven? Heard three eleven too. Okay, got it. So like like the Diablos, the Lamborghini machines, those are big, big parts of your formative years, eh? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now supercars are a lot more prevalent yeah i feel like forward. within the last 10 years like it's blew up again but i feel like the 90s really set the president the president <laughs> uh that the president and yes. and showed what was possible and kind of like blew the whole supercar thing out of the water because we had just come out of like the malaise era and people were like i want something fast and flashy and purple and green are really cool right now so let's just make cars like that for sure. And I think, you know, from like the 60s to the 80s, like cars that would be c considered supercars today. I mean, they were just called sports cars, you know? Yeah. Because they were they were really fast. Yeah. Not the 90s were great for supercars because they literally defined that genre. Yeah. That's when you started seeing like advanced materials like carbon fiber. Oh, that, that's it. That's it really for me. Yeah. It's only fiber. carbon fiber. That's the only qualifier. Uh, I think we should just get right into it, yeah? Let's go! Let's go! So, how did we get to the 90s being the definitive era of supercars? The term supercar itself isn't really official. It roughly describes a high-performance luxury or exotic sports car, generally a two-seater with at least an eight-cylinder engine, although that'll probably change here. The trend towards these vehicles started as far back as the 60s when Detroit started shoehorning big block V8s into sedans and turning the results loose on the American public. And of course, we know those as muscle cars. Across the Atlantic, European manufacturers were also busy refining their lightweight sports cars. What these smaller cars lacked in displacement and seating, they made up for easily in handling and drivability. As the 60s turned into the 70s, those massive motors became liabilities with the looming gas crisis and Clean Air Act of 1970. Then, the second oil crisis in 1979 shocked the industry yet again, and American cars continued to get smaller and more efficient. Manufacturers in the U.S. knew they had to do something, so their carburetors were replaced by fuel injection and distributors were being swapped for coil packs. But we weren't there yet. After all, the 1985 Corvette made around the same horsepower as a well-equipped 2020 Camry. 
The so-called malaise era, when U.S. autos reached a low point of reliability and performance, was in full swing. New emissions equipment was starving the motors of their power, and even in the instances where these new cars had style, the 85 Corvette being a prime example, what was under the hood didn't match up. That being said, the 80s were still an impressive decade for supercars, just not in the United States. American consumers, still reeling from the death of the muscle car scene, started looking abroad for inspiring performance. Every decade is a reaction to the one that came before, and the 80s shoved back the 70s with an absolute explosion of high-performance supercars. A handful of imported performance cars like the Lamborghini Countach, Ferrari Testarossa, and the Lotus Esprit were blowing enthusiasts' minds. And with the stock market looking like Pike's Peak, they were selling faster than cocaine in Wall Street bathrooms. By the 90s, a lot of that pesky emissions tech that was thrust on manufacturers was starting to get smarter, as were onboard computers and fuel injectors. The progressing technology let engines breathe better and pass their gases in ways that didn't starve the performance. Nice. If you if you like stories like this, check out our podcast, Pass Gas. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrities and rich folks were having a hard time justifying spending big bucks on stiff bucket seats and jarring track suspension setups, and manufacturers took the hint. For example, Lamborghini spent the late 80s upgrading the Countach into the Diablo. The Countach is often derided for having a borderline, unusably tight interior that overheats quickly, so they lengthened the Diablo to improve the comfortability in the cabin. The I think the word is just comfort. Yeah, right? <laughs> Comfortability. I've never heard of that. Is that a Diablo right there? This is a Diablo right here. And it's purple Whoa. too? Yeah. That's the Dude. poster that I had. There you go. Look at that. Man, it's crazy Like yeah. how in pictures they look so big, but in real life they're so little. Yeah, I can't get into this. <laughs> yeah, the there's heck? no way I could fit into that car. For the audio listeners, I, I I'm holding a uh, a a purple Diablo uh, one to one the, scale. Yeah, it's one one eighteenth Maisto scale or Maisto model. I think this is of the the Yota variant, which is like the 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 equivalent of the the Aventador SVJ today. Like this is the top trim performance. So that's a Toyota. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a toy. Yep, nice, nice Joe. Nice a Toyota. The Countach is often derided for having a borderline unusable interior that overheats quickly, so they lengthened the Diablo to improve the comfort in the cabin. The Countach's 380 horsepower V12 was a great motor for the 80s, but this was a new decade called the 90s. So the Diablo <laughs> got an improved version of it based on the same platform, now pushing 485 horsepower through some tech tweaks and freeing up some emissions issues. Same. This helped the Diablo to be the first Lambo to break 200 miles per hour. That's wild. Well, speaking of the, uh, that tight interior they're talking about, James, like for the mo for like the longest time, like the Italian sports car companies were building, uh, building their cars for Italians for Italian, yeah, Italian dimensions. So like you had these amazing cars that if you're like over five ten, you're gonna have a problem fitting into yeah there's like um, 20 ashtrays <laughs> yeah <laughs> a wine holder <laughs> but like the 90s is w when we start to see them kind of like embrace a more like well american uh, uh customer base mm -hmm. but i mean they didn't i don't think supercars really get comfortable for like average ever? size americans until yeah, probably like ever 2015 yeah it was in the pantera like you had to sit sideways to make it fit pretty much i watched nolan uh the pantera is one of nolan's dream cars and uh, -huh. uh we were at a shop getting the z's dyno tuned and there was one parked in the in the parking lot and i watched a dream die <laughs> when, when <laughs> as nolan, he tried to sit in <laughs> yeah he yeah. sat in it and he's like well can't get one of these ever oh uh, no yeah uh I, like i was just like like literally like jammed into it and like mm -hmm. the steering wheel is like in your chest. Oh my god! And you have to like put your legs. Yeah, you do have to like put them all the yeah. way to the side. It's it's not not comfortable. Well, hopefully uh, you'll have enough money one day that you can do what Shaq did with his <laughs> Vader, <yeah. laughs> and have it lengthened by like a foot and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, now the thing now my move is not the the Pantera, but to see if I can fit in the Mangusta oh, that we okay. talked about. 
in the uh what was that that was the uh um, Daytona so episode that we yeah. talked about Ford was... gt40 R- very roomy supercar <laughs> i got to sit in a uh just a gt the 2005 version not roomy not roomy but i was able to get in that yeah you can't uh, even move the seats you move the pedals that's oh wild. that's crazy yeah 20 miles down the road from Lamborghini, their main competitors were already plotting on how to upgrade their own flagship model when the Diablo dropped in January of 1990. The master craftsman at Ferrari spent 30 months secretly developing and testing the Diablo's new nemesis. And in the late summer of 1996, while the Olympics were going on, they unveiled the highly anticipated 550 Marinello at the Nürburgring. This is the car from Bad Boys 2. The 550 in Marinello meant that it had a 5.5 liter V12 that pushed the car to nearly 500 horsepower. It had a 0 to 60 time, a tenth of a second faster than the Ferrari Testarossa. And much like Lamborghini, Ferrari also improved the comfort of the cockpit extensively. They also replaced a mid-engine design with a return to the front-engine rear-wheel drive configuration they'd been using up until 1973 because, as Enzo Ferrari famously said, The horses, uh, they pull at the carriage. They don't push it in. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a reason. <laughs> this is a machine. It's not a horse. No, I think about it. Think about it. No. You thinking about it? No. Me, Sarah okay. Enzo, I don't need to think it's a good idea. Look, look. Okay. The look. horses, where are they? Hmm? They're in the front. Do they, they push or do they pull? Well, since do they they're push in the front, or they, they pull. pull. They're in the front, huh? Yes. And what do they do? They push or they carry? <laughs> look, I they don't, don't want to argue anymore. Okay, let's go get a spaghetti. Let's go get a spaghetti. Some bolognese. Ooh, yeah. Let's go get a mortadella sandwich. A gabagoo. <laughs> My <laughs> grandma says she has sent a horse that around. I will say the 550 Marinello, there's two Ferraris I would want to want to buy. Yes. 550 Marinello. Is one of them. Or the uh, F430 Scuderia, which comes okay. a little later. The 90s started with a wave of American optimism. As Bill Clinton famously wailed on his sax on primetime television, he had every reason to jam out. Starting in 1992, the U.S. economy was booming. It grew around 4% per year until 1999. Since 2001, it hasn't bested 3%. The dot-com bubble was also growing. And although Pets.com and its contemporaries would one day bust in spectacular fashion, throughout the 90s, 1.7 million jobs a year were added to the American workforce and unemployment dropped to 4% by the end of the decade. Wow. This helped U.S. households grow their income by almost 10% and to drop the poverty rate to its lowest it had been since World War II. Technology was also the buzzword of the decade. By the end of the 90s, most consumers had easy access to cell phones, but they weren't yet smart. You could make calls and play some snake, but that was about it. Social media had yet to take over our lives with nonstop interaction and we could ignore our offices at the end of the day and not respond to emails all night. We had the benefit of amazing technological advances without also being overwhelmed by them. Large advanced braking systems and power assist steering were being installed, but there was no overbearing computer systems monitoring how you drive and deciding where you need traction. And emissions improvements were freeing up horsepower. That's like, do you remember we did that wheelhouse video a while back about how modern cars like weigh you and send that information to oh yeah like third party companies Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) and send that information to your bully (laughs) (laughs) Uh, how does he know (laughs) okay (laughs) so as i was saying technology had not yet completely taken over uh the supercar yet kelsey Grammer's dodge viper is a perfect example of this melding of advancements and power that is designed to put a smile on the face of enthusiasts. It had a 10-cylinder engine. Uh, I don't think 10-cylinders sound very good, just my opinion. Uh, 450 horsepower, while also having no traction control, no stability control, no side airbags, and no anti-lock brakes at all. Uh Uh-oh. Nolan. Uh, What? The LFA would like to know your location. 
Yeah, well, that's different. That's a smaller displacement V10. Okay, so I guess you're just uh, making excuses now? I am moving the goalposts a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll cop to that. Uh, the V10 is the exception that proves the rule. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, by all accounts, the Viper was a death trap, but also very amazing to drive. I would like to drive one and see for myself. First gen? First gen, yeah. I want to see. I want to see what people are talking about. Which one do you want the most? This, you like the second gen, huh? Wait, yeah, I believe so. It's a second gen. I could get my model real quick. Isn't it like GTS or something? That The blue one with the gray stripes? Whatever gen this one is. I believe this is second gen. The first gen was only like a couple of years, and it was really kind of angular and funky looking. This is more of like a smoother design. Uh, I would have red with white racing stripes like this model right here. That one uh, looks like uh, Joe Camel's head. <laughs> it does. It does. Like this. To learn more about that, check out our episode on uh, Camel Trophy. Yeah. Second Gen Viper. Yeah, that would be Second Gen Viper. That's the one I like. <laughs> Even cars like the Lamborghini Diablo, while powered by an advanced 48-valve V12, it still had zero traction control systems, no stability control, and no computer making sure you didn't light up the rear wheels while cornering or downshifting. Some consider that a bad thing, but for enthusiasts, it's the reason they're out there buying up all the older supercars, and also because they can afford to. Yeah, we use enthusiasts a lot in this episode. Um, I guess they're enthusiasts, but they're also like rich, rich, rich guys. Yeah, yeah. they also have a, a bunch of other hobbies that are all expensive. So. Like watches. Watches and, and cigars and wine. Yeah, cigars and wine. And, and nice brandies. Taking, taking their wives to fancy dinners. Uh, you want to go from being a billionaire to a millionaire? Try buying a vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> if any supercar from the 90s could be dubbed a literal poster child, it was the Lamborghini Diablo. It rocketed to fame and sold more posters to drooling teenage boys than Carmen Electra. Ooh. <laughs> I have a serious and unanswerable question. Was more money made from the sale of these posters than of all actual Diablos ever sold? Comment down below. Like and subscribe. For many of us, the Diablo was our first taste of the exhilarating world of beastly performance and the titillating world of beautifully shaped aerodynamic bodies. We grew up riding in the back of Ford Tauruses and Volvo 240s, so the sight of the Diablo wedge not only matched our childhood drawings, but also all of our dreams of success. And some of our friends with more quote-unquote chill parents even had the Diablo poster featuring a supermodel filling up her gas tank in Los Angeles. I did have a Diablo poster, and I'm trying to remember if it was like, it was a purple one, but I think it was like the light metallic purple, which was a really cool. Oh, I know option. what you're talking about. Yeah, mm, I know that color. Good color. You know um, what I would do, speaking of Lamborghini purple, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Find a wrecked Diablo. Yank that engine, put stuff that sucker into a Plymouth Cuda, which was famous for being available in Plum Crazy, oh. right? But then paint that car Lamborghini purple. And do like Lamborghini doors on it too? I think that's a bit West Coast Customs. Next stop, SEMA. If anyone wants to sponsor that build that's or steal it for themselves. Ring bros, <laughs> ring bros, we're looking at you. Yeah, ring bros, hit me up. Let's go. Let's, ring let's bros, go. hit up Nolan. Nolan's phone number is... We're all looking for ways to save money, right? Especially now. So let me ask you this, Kyle. How'd you like to keep an extra $961 a year in your pocket? That's how much Gabby customers save per year on average on car and home insurance. That's why when I was shopping for car insurance, I went with Gabby. This time of year, a lot of people are searching for new insurance, trying to maybe get a lower rate or something. Well, Gabby takes the pain out of insurance shopping by giving you an apples to apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Nationwide, Progressive, and Farmers. All you have to do is just link your current insurance coverage and in just minutes, you'll be able to see quotes for the exact same coverage. I just got a Forerunner and it was super easy to add it to my insurance. Bopped over to Gabby.com and I put my insurance information in there. Within just a couple of seconds, I had 
a comparison with a bunch of other insurance providers and I was able to find an even lower rate than I was paying at the time. It was super helpful and I would do it again in a second. And like I mentioned before, Gabby insurance customers save an average of $961 per year. What do you spend $960 on per year? Like gas or, you know, your alternator blown up? And you can relax because if they can't find you the savings that you are looking for, you can relax knowing that you have the best rate out there. And they'll never sell your info. You're never gonna get spam calls or signed up for some extended car warranty scam call. I hate those things. Let's be honest, you're probably overpaying for car and home insurance. See how much Gabby can save you. It's totally free to check and there's no obligation to buy anything. So go to gabby.com slash gas. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash gas to let them know we sent you. Thank you, Gabby. COVID spring break is right around the corner and you know what that means, guys? Spring break in your pants. Manscaped is here to ensure that the party in your pants never stops. You heard me say this at the top. Manscaped has the best tools for your grooming experience. You already know that. Lawnmower 3.0. Boys, get yourself one of these trimmers. You will be very impressed by this ball hair trimmer. I am guaranteeing you that. It's got ceramic blades with advanced skin safe technology. It's also waterproof. It has an LED on it, which uh, you probably heard me say before, but that LED is a game changer. You might be a busy guy and you got other things to do. I'm telling you right now, it's time to trim it up. It's time to step your game up. You'll feel better. They've also got the performance package that you can pick up. Comes with the, the lawnmower, but also the weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer. Got to get on that, guys. Use the best tools for the job. Plus, also check out the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver Ball Toner sprays for your balls so they smell nice. Got to have that. Don't want stanky balls. Just don't. For everyone preparing for a pants party this spring break, I have an exclusive 20% off discount. Use code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code GAS20. Thank you very much, Manscaped, for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Back to the show. The Diablo beat back the banal styling of the family grocery getters that were looking a bit too conservative after the muscle car era, and that image sold like crazy. But while all the 15-year-olds were tacking the posters into their parents' drywall, people with money were getting behind the wheel of Diablo and found that looks matched the drivability. The car was ubiquitous in mass media, an easy symbol for the excesses of the era. From Ocean's Eleven, Gone in 60 Seconds, Dumb and Dumber, in the movies to music videos made by musicians like Ludacris and Jumaine Dupree, and endlessly talked about on Top Gear more than a decade later in 2002 when the show started and Jeremy Clarkson sang the supercar's praises at every chance. While there were definitely better supercars being produced in the 90s, None got the attention of the Diablo. Diablo. So what were those better cars? For many of the creators of high-performance vehicles, the focus was not only on style, but setting records. Top among them was Jaguar, looking to roar onto the scene by building a supercar that could set a new speed record to match its feline namesake. Name, namesake, excuse me. The issue was that all of the company's engineering resources were tied up with the development of their XJ and XJS models. Upper management was reluctant to pull staff from their successful posh daily driver division, so they turned to Tom Walkinshaw of Tom Walkinshaw Racing, who was riding high on snagging 11 wins out of 11 races in the British Saloon Car Championships of 1983. Jaguar partnered with TWR and they formed a joint venture, Jaguar Sport Limited, to build race cars starting in 1987, and they focused on the development of Project XJ220. The 220 in the name was a callback to the XK120 Jaguar built in the late 40s with the goal of a 120 mile per hour top speed. But as the name suggests, the XJ220 would break 220 miles per hour. Engine designer Walter Hassan, who had previously developed the 48 valve version of Jag's V12, came on board for their horsepower development needs. Mike Morton, who managed Ford's RS200 Group B rally program, came on as project manager and they all got to work. The XJ220 emerged from the R&D garage in 1989, and a few years later headed to Fort Stockton, Texas for high-speed testing. With their goal firmly set at 220, they delivered a disappointing but still record-breaking top speed of 212.3 miles per hour, the fastest of any production car of the time. So uh, maybe we shouldn't have named it 
two twenty before we tried it. So too late to name it XJ two twelve point three. It's like naming your kid valedictorian and he's a dum dum. <laughs> the Guinness Book of World Records logged their achievement, but it was bittersweet. With Martin Brundle, who was fresh off a twenty four hour Le Mans win of nineteen ninety, they headed to the Nardo Ring in Italy, followed by a crew of journalists. After a few runs, Brundle couldn't push the car beyond the previous 212.3 and reported that the XJ220 was hitting the rev limiter. Mechanics boosted the rev limiter to 7,900 RPM and tore off the catalytic converters to replace them with straight pipes to get more power. Maybe. And it kind of worked. Sort of. The Jaguar broke past 212 and climbed all the way to 217.1 miles per hour, breaking the team's own previous record for top speed. The Guinness Book of World Records logged their achievement, but it was bittersweet. Three miles per hour short of their true goal. The XJ220 was, in reality, an XJ217. Burn. Yeah, super burn. What's the fastest you guys have ever been in a car? 168. Whoa. When I went to Vegas for uh, for Bumper to Bumper and we were doing the, the Indy car, I think I hit like 150. Didn't feel like 150, so I don't know. You didn't it have felt radar slower gun. or what? Felt slower, but I, I don't know. I was really focused on nailing those those corners. Mm, yeah, think... you love nailing them corners, don't you, boy? That's <laughs> right, baby. In the high stakes video game that was Supercars, two hundred and seventeen miles per hour was now the high score to beat. At a factory in Campagliano, Modena, Italy, a team of engineers sought to add their names to the record books. Uh, I've been there. I've been there. I've driven on these roads. All right. If you want to watch me do that, check out uh, the episode of Bumper to Bumper where I go to Italy and I cry because it's such a beautiful experience. A lot of plugs in today's episode. Shut the f- <laughs> front door, you little beef. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Guys, if you like what you're hearing, uh, you can subscribe to this podcast and then it'll be a lot easier to find it when you open up whatever app you're listening to this on. And it really helps us out. It's a a way that our boss knows that we're doing a good job and then maybe he might feed us. We don't want to eat. Money is out of the question, but food we do need. The concept was the Bugatti EB110, a proper legacy for namesake Atori Bugatti. The 110 in the title was a nod to the 110th anniversary of the Bugatti founder's birth. And the project's unveiling led to the coining of the hypercar term by journalists to describe the car. (laughs) Hypercar was hyperbolic, considering the vehicle didn't yet exist, but it captured the spirit of the time. Designers were looking to out-super supercars, and the press was all too happy to join in on the hypercar hype. The best of the best in the Italian automotive design world took shots at designing the EB110. But Romano Artioli, president of Bugatti at the time, was not impressed. He was all like, no, it's not very good. <laughs> he pushed Marcello Gandini, designer of the Mura, Countach, and Pantera, with completing his vision. Gandini did a few redesigns, but Artioli continued to be unhappy with the look of the car. So he looked to Gianpaolo. So he looked to Gianpaolo Bandini. <laughs> Just name, you name your kids English. <laughs> <laughs> So he looked to John Paolo Benedini, the blue factory designer, to make his demanded changes. The new design was softer and sadly replaced the pop-up up and down headlights with fixed ones, but paid homage to the Bugattis of the past. Artioli swapped out some engineers and designers, and whatever changes he made worked. The EB110 features tons of innovative technologies that were rarities at the time. Active aerodynamics, carbon fiber monocoque chassis, Innovative all-wheel drive systems were all added to the Bugatti and made it stand out in a field of tough competitors that were blowing away records. The heart of the EB110 was a made-from-scratch 3.5-liter quad-turbocharged V12 that put 553 horsepower to the wheels. Its 0-60 to was clocked at 3.6 seconds, which is not super impressive today, but back then it was a competitor for the top spot especially with a 209 mile per hour top speed falling just shy of the Jaguar XJ 220s first record breaking run of 217 miles per hour, which stood until another supercar destroyed it by more than 20 miles per hour 
a year later. The EB-110 was definitely fast, but it was also taking the lessons of the Acura NSX to heart and made the car easy to drive, whether you were trying to set track records or picking up groceries. The Bugatti was definitely peak supercar because it was not only a screamer, it was civilized. It had carefully designed power steering and was compliant to the driver. And the all-wheel drive's 2773 front rear torque split delivered traction without being an overbearing nuisance. This was the dream of 90s supercars. Easy to drive, but insanely fast. Lots of grip, but you could break it free and corner with a grin. A Tori Bugatti was spinning in his grave. But it was the good kind of spinning. <laughs> like dancing. Only he's dead. In a coffin. Or probably a mausoleum. That's like the, I mean, that's kind of the, 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 that's Bugatti's kind of strategy is just making these insane supercars that you don't have to have any compromise with in terms of anything else. Like you can just do anything yeah. with your supercar. Meanwhile, an American challenger was entering the supercar fray. And it might be a name you're not familiar with. The designer was Gerald Weiger and the car was the Vector W8. Weigert was a man who built his entire career on larger-than-life claims, perfect for the hyped-up world of supercars. He claimed his Vector W8, which was to be produced by Gerald's company, Vector Aeromotive, would easily break 240 miles per hour, making it the fastest production car by a huge margin. He also claimed a 0-60 to time in the high three seconds, enough to beat out most supercars at the time. Weigert was the kind of kid who tells you his dad is a fighter pilot and then a week later tells you he's the president's <laughs> bodyguard. In other words, he could be full of shit. I had a friend, I think I've talked about this before. I had a friend, Matt Regan, who told me that his dad designed the steps in Goldeneye. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, when Batman Returns came out, I told all my friends that I had seen Batman 3. Uh, <laughs> <and> I, <laughs> I told my best friend Marley in like first grade that I knew Kung Fu. <laughs> I think the lesson here is never trust a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never trust a kid. Uh, anyway, over the years, Weigert also claimed to be responsible for inventing the personal watercraft, four-wheel ATV, and even the minivan. Um, here's a past gas official fact check. None of these claims are true. We should tell the story of the minivan, though. We're like the Snopes of cars. <laughs> Instead of the low displacement V12, the W8 featured a massive 6-liter twin turbocharged V8 loosely based on Chevy's V8 design. The interior departed from the typical supercar design as well. Due to the transversely mounted V8 behind the driver, there was no transmission hump, so the occupants had plenty of room to play footsie in their plush buckets that were mounted an inch apart. There wasn't even a shifter to split the space. Weigert mounted the ratchet shifter connected to the beefy GM-sourced three-speed automatic on the driver's left against the door sill. That's really bizarre. Yeah. And the weird shifter wasn't the only jet fighter look of the cockpit. There was one of those green display instrument clusters you see in 80s movies, more reminiscent of monitoring a nuclear launch than revving an engine. So it, had, it was weird. It, it was, <laughs> the gauges were weird. <laughs> In 1991, the Vector took a mighty blow to its reputation when Andre Agassi demanded a refund after his W8 almost caught fire when the overheating exhaust toasted his rear carpeting. Around that time, car and driver got their hands on three W8s ready to put them through the ringer and test those bold claims. Instead, all three cars broke down and car and driver used it as an example of never trusting a manufacturer's claims moving forward. Fun fact about Andre Agassi, he... Didn't like playing tennis. He was just really good at it. <laughs> and it only came out like way after his career had ended that he was like, yeah, I just didn't like it at all. Yeah. He is also like super like he was famous for his long hair, <clears throat> but it was a wig. What? Wait, I thought Andre Agassi was the bald dude and he was known well, for being bald. Well, yeah. now he's known for being bald. But for oh. a while, he was known for like have, like as like the cool new guy with like <laughs> a long ponytail. Yeah. And, and once before, like either like. Wimbledon or like the British Open or something, his like wig fell apart and he performed really poorly because him and his brother were up all night trying to fix his wig. Oh my God. Why? No one... <laughs> oh, Pete Sampras is the other dude. They were like, they always pitted them against each other, right? Yeah. 
I liked Andre. Seeing him on TV. On Andre Agassi. Andrea Andrea <laughs> Andrea Gassi. Yeah. Andrea Gassi. <laughs> uh he was cool. She was cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny that he didn't like tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Do you guys know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? I'm not making this up, I swear. Not only were they the first patented motor oil in the game, they've also had a lot of firsts in the oil industry. Well, what are the first, you might ask me? Well, they were the first high mileage oil, they were the first synthetic blend, and they were the first racing oil. It's a lot of firsts. And after 150 years or so, they haven't stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil that Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. 40%? It's proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown. And what are those, Joe? Well, good thing you asked, because they are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. We talk a lot about racing legends on the show, and one of the reasons that we love Valvoline so much is because they're synonymous with all these great racing legends. Mark Martin, Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and the new NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott. So go on and do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline oil. Head over to valvoline.com original to find the best Valvoline oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Anyway, back to the WA. To the car's credit, Road and Track had an entirely different experience with the scrappy and very weird vectors. Uh, Road and Track had zero issues with the cars and posted 0 to 60 times of 4.2 seconds, which was short of the manufacturer's claims, but not by much. They weren't able to test the top speed, but based on the red line of the GM3 speed, Road and Track estimated the W8 could hit 218 miles per hour. They looked at the Vector with rose-colored glasses and gave tons of credit to Weigert for sticking with his vision and producing a true production supercar. These things are neat looking. I've seen we've seen them in person. We when we went to Radwood uh, yeah. at the at the Peterson a couple years ago, there was one there, and it's uh, pretty funky looking, but pretty interesting. Yeah, it looks um, like a character in like a future cop movie. Yeah. Weigert wasn't the only guy out there trying to independently develop a supercar. Once the 90s exotic car momentum started rolling, a handful of other players tried to get in on the action. In 1991, a handful of ex lamborghini machine employees led by Claudio Zampoli jumped into the pool and launched the Cizetta Moroder B16T. That's how it's pronounced. Which looks like a Testarosta and a Countach had a secret love child. Ooh, can you imagine? <laughs> this is not surprising considering that the Cezetta was designed by Marcello Gandini. He actually used his initial Diablo designs as a basis for the Cezetta body. Wait, is this a... This looks like a Diablo. Is this a Diablo? This is like the velvet revolver of cars. <laughs> the motor was perhaps the most notable part of the Cezetta, a true 6-liter V16 mounted transversely behind the driver. In actual fact, just two Lamborghini Uraco dual overhead cam V8s welded into a single block. It produced a whopping 540 horsepower. But as innovative or interesting as the Cezetta was, its contribution to the history books will always fall on its four, yes, four pop-up headlights making it the best looking car of all time <laughs> east of italy the czechs were getting involved in the supercar world as well tatra the third oldest car company in the world still making cars to this day debuted the tatra mtx v8 in 1991 it was designed by vaklav kral and was the fastest czech car of all time with a zero to 60 of 5.6 seconds the 302 horsepower 3.9 liter v8 made a top speed of 165 miles per hour this was small potatoes for even 90 supercar standards, but it brought up a lot of attention to the Czech car scene and the 100-year-old truck company building them, especially since every other car Tatra made was crumbling Soviet bloc nightmare fuel. Meanwhile, in France, Axum, the company known for pumping out cars that look a lot like the current smart car in the U.S., drove into the supercar game from the middle of nowhere with an off-road offering, the Megatrack. 
This thing is sick. This off-road supercar, which looks like a Dodge Stealth with a lift kit, had some strange notions of what qualified as a supercar. The Mega was a four-seater with a Mercedes V12 that boasted more torque than horsepower, and its sheer size made the not-so-small Diablo look like a subcompact because it had a body that was more than two feet longer. That's weird because it looks like a small car, but maybe it's just the big wheels that make it look small. The Mega was dubbed a supercar at the time, and it was. But today, it would fall firmly into the crossover territory and would be bested by any BMW or Mercedes SUV currently on the market. When you line up all the performance numbers, it's pretty close to an X3. (laughs) In Japan, unlike the US and Europe, the economy was stagnating, making supercars less appealing to manufacturers and consumers alike. But Honda still made a notable entry to the genre in the form of the new sports car experimental, the NSX, as it was known, looked exotic but timeless. There was no slouch under the hood. A three liter V6 delivered 270 horsepower to the rear wheels, which was 25 more horsepower than the 1989 Corvette. The Acura NSX was also the first place that Americans got their hands on a little thing called VTEC. Ooh. Nice. This wasn't some one-off Honda produced to circumvent racing loopholes. They made more NSXs in 1991 than Lamborghini made Diablos in the entire 1990s. The lead engineer of the NSX, Shigeru Uehara, focused heavily on making the car as light as possible with the specific goals of making it easy to handle, submissive to the driver, and better than the Ferrari 328. Besting the 328 was cited often as the most important goal. And Ayrton Senna had one, and he loved it. He helped develop it. Yeah, who could forget that classic video of him driving it around, I think, Fuji. In loafers. In, in loafers. laugh. <laughs> 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 Clearly, supercars were having a moment all over the globe. But we've saved the best and most British for last. It was a project led by Gordon Murray, who spent his formative years designing the successful Brabham racing cars. He was busy putting together a jolly good team of designers and engineers with the goal of making every other performance car on the market look like a freaking Yugo. Dude, punching down, I love it. (laughs) Murray had a vision for a supercar that would combine the history of Formula One designs with his personal car of choice, the Honda NSX he had fallen in love with. He was sold on the idea of an easily drivable supercar, and how he built the McLaren F1 proved it. Murray's undying obsession over every aspect of the car paid off. When he set out to build the F1, he took a piece of paper and wrote down his must-haves. Quote, No compromise. No plastic. Three-seat layout. Use F1 technology to create ground effect. Automatic retractable aero devices. Composite monocoque in body, survival cell a la F1, F1 engine, six speed transaxle, carbon clutch, electronic differential, okay, 200 mile per hour plus top speed. Mm-hmm. I don't want to make the same mistake as Jaguar there. <laughs> More than 1G in lateral acceleration, hmm. F1 push or Pull rod suspension. Uh, oh, pull rod. That's which one uh, later? Yes. Um, carbon brakes. Um, a pedal. <laughs> <laughs> that should be pretty easy. <laughs> Steering and gear change position to suit the buyer. Baguette. Oranges. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong and, list. And a partridge in a pear tree. Ha <laughs> 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 Gordon. You devil, you sly devil. You sod. (laughs) It was a long and exacting list of elements to refuse compromise over, but the team Murray assembled kept to the plan. Murray attributes a big portion of his success to being able to start with a clean slate. Ferrari and Lamborghini, for example, have past models to improve on, which makes good economic sense, but impedes innovation. For the F1, they tried new things, like building a supercar without a flywheel, and a weird one plus two seating arrangement where the driver sits in the middle and has a passenger to each side. At the end of the day, he created what many consider to be the greatest car of all time. 
The car was packed with proprietary designs and technologies. It utilized the BMW S72 V12 engine, which rocketed the British supercar from 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds and 0 to 100 in 6.3, could still hit 200 miles per hour from stopped in just 28 seconds. These numbers were jaw-dropping, but it was the top speed of 240.1 that was so shocking. It took more than a decade for Bugatti to beat it with the Veyron when it hit 267 in 2005 with a 487 cubic inch quad turbo V16. The McLaren? It's naturally aspirated. That's so cool. Yeah, that's pretty... <laughs> man. The coolest car ever made. The British car magazine Auto Car called the McLaren the finest car built for the road up to that point and deemed its release one of the greatest events in automotive history. Mr. Bean himself loved the car so much, he wound up wrecking it. Twice. <laughs> Other famous owners include Elon Musk, Jay Leno, George Harrison, Ralph Lauren, Nick Mason, and, of course, our buddy, the Sultan of Brunei. He's not our buddy. You guys not our buddy. He's our close, James Pumphrey's close personal <laughs> friend, the Sultan of Brunei. Let's get that rumor started. <laughs> <laughs> Collectors all over the planet drool over F1s when they come out for auctions, and bids have gone as high as $20 million. It's a cool car. At the turn of the millennium, the supercar was at its peak. It was an almost impossible task to dominate the F1 after it had set the bar so high. After 9-11, the economy took a serious hit, and many people's outlook went from glossy to gritty. Millionaires were still buying supercars, but the shine had started to come off the edges just a little bit. Big hair and big suits were replaced with jeans and indie band t-shirts, whiskey and cocaine with craft beer and joints, supercars with, well, just regular cars. Regular cars, which we should emphasize that due to the trickle-down effect of car tech, were getting a lot cooler. The Mustangs and the Camaros of the mid-2000s were becoming competitive with supercars that dominated the scene just 20 years before. Better yet, you could actually buy one without having to remortgage your house. While supercars continue to innovate with powerful electric motors and space-age suspension technology, they've also started to feel less like cars and more like computers with seats. The supercars of the 90s were the last ones that broke records without technology controlling more of the ride than the driver, a standard that we'll likely never return to. The upcoming 2,000 horsepower equivalent electric supercars will no doubt be beautiful machines using artificial intelligence to control motor response and suspension reactions, but will they be any fun? When engine sounds have to be piped through the stereo, is something lost? And where can you even drive a totally silent 300 <laughs> mile per hour supercar? Yeah, that's nuts. I do feel like like it's not considered a supercar, but when you had that M4, James, it's just too fast and it's like too comfortable. You don't realize how fast you're getting and then there's no fun in like getting that fast. Yeah, it was definitely too fast for me to drive. That's awesome. I felt the same way when we uh, we had the C8 Corvette. I took it out to the canyons, met up with uh, some buddies, and I just could not. I couldn't drive it. Like, I mean, I could drive it, but like, I knew that I was not enough driver to like push it the way it was designed to be. You know, I had so much fun in that C8. It was a great I, car. Yeah, it was a really wonderful fun. car. My favorite part was going like driving down the interstate at like having cruise control set at like a hundred and just chilling. <laughs> yeah. The closed course interstate. Yeah, yeah. In Mexico. Our roads and appetite for cars are changing along with the rules governing them. We'll never have another perfect culmination like the wild, wild west of nineteen ninety supercars. We will never recapture the feeling of ninety supercars. There isn't a single executive at any car company today that would allow another early 90s Dodge Viper to hit the streets. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be illegal. The 2020 Hellcat, which has double the horsepower, also has double the safety nets and nanny tech to keep you from spinning into oncoming traffic. But honestly, guys, where's the fun in that? <laughs> I mean, there was, that was a lot of fun driving around in that, too. Yeah. Not going not yeah. to lie. Uh, I would say that the Demon is probably pretty close to the Viper in that uh, it... it it comes from the factory with drag radial tires, which are not meant for the street. Those are meant for prepped racing surfaces, like a drag strip. <laughs> so if you get on the gas too much, like you, you can spin out. Um, oh yeah, it's it's a lot of fun though. <laughs> on the other hand, '90s supercars were only accessible to a tiny, coked-up sliver of the population that could afford them. 
car performance may never reach its 90s glory. Well, I mean, it's already eclipsed it, but it's also becoming a lot more accessible. It's the reason why we here at Donut tend to focus more on cars you can actually afford than the ones you only ever own as a poster or a die cast. The 90s were an incredible time for supercars, but even then, they were always more of a dream than a real thing, more of a concept than a reality. For the vast majority of us, we own as many supercars now as we did in the 90s, which is zero. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're Kelsey Grammer, that is. So yeah, don't don't drink and drive. Definitely don't drink and drive if you're in a Viper. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I I do think that the '90s were the best time in terms of the idea of what the supercar is. You know, uh, a lot of them had manual transmission and very heavy clutches and very Mm -hmm. limited, like. Those were cars that were dangerous, you know? Like, that yeah. was part of the appeal, was that that at any time, this car was trying to kill you. <laughs> Why is that fun? It's... It, Why is that it's fun? It's just the danger factor. It's, you know, there's other, there's other things in life that have that same appeal. I'm not saying uh, I don't think it's fun. I'm saying why. I don't know. Why is it fun? Well, it lets you, like, uh, it lets you peer into that void, you know? Gets you from... It, that that void the, the 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 cavern between living and death you know you, you want to know how that. i got these scars yeah exactly <laughs> uh you want to know appeal. how i drive these cars <laughs> oh nice <laughs> oh a little variation yeah nice. car enthusiast you, joker is a good you, character <laughs> like when we we're at uh when we were at vegas when i was at vegas with the the b2b team on the <laughs> oval like you know you're just strapped into this thing and like you're just hurtling around this oval, getting pressed into that banking corner, and like if you know if the car did lose grip and you spun out and smashed into the wall, that's really gonna freaking hurt, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. you might get messed up, especially. But in a you car can't that... think about that when you're pushing the. Limits. No, exactly. Can't. So like that's 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 the appeal is like that is at the back of your mind, but also you're like that thought's at the back of your mind, but it's it's fighting with the thought of like I want to go faster. That's you like know? I mean this is on a much smaller scale but like skateboarding every uh-huh. single thing you do you know you could break your leg for sure and you have to just like put that aside and go for it and yep. and confidence is what gets you through yeah it's like when i when i go in to pet my 16 pound golden doodle <laughs> and like one in every 25 times she like snaps at me a little bit yeah, uh-huh. yeah. and i'm like whoa <laughs> it doesn't yeah, so, stop you though no, yeah I birdie 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 is a 90 supercar and like a big like 120 pound <laughs> chocolate lab, that's like today's yeah. supercar, right? You know, it's, like it's be- like bigger, more powerful, but safer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Birdie's little dangerous. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> in a little, in a little floof angel. <laughs> uh, so I guess that's that's the episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you, I hope everyone listening is doing well. Tell a friend about the show. Follow James Pumphrey on all social media at James Pumphrey. Follow, please follow Joe Weber. Please follow Joe Weber at Joe G Weber. He deserves it. I don't want to come off as thirsty, but uh, I'm pretty thirsty, pretty <laughs> horny for follows. <laughs> <laughs> and follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. And if you liked this show, please subscribe uh, so our boss will give us some food. We are so hungry. Yeah, I had to go get my own Lucky Charms. Thank you to our producer, Bridget and Thomas. And our writer, Jake. Uh, yeah, see you next time. Uh, be kind. Keep it juiced. And I'm going to say double keep it juiced. Let's make keep it juiced a huge thing. Keep it juiced! Keep it juiced. Take care of each other. See you next time. <laughs>